Hello everybody. With the arrival of electrification, the rise of the SUV now seems unstoppable, with almost every manufacturer trying to turn their range into a series of slightly differently sized SUVs. However, if you are a sporty petrol head that wants something fun yet practical, you do still have a few options available. And today, we're looking at one of the more outlandish ones, the Peugeot 508 PSE. I received the email a couple of months ago offering me this car for review, and I couldn't say yes quick enough for a couple of reasons. First off, I do have a bit of a thing for Peugeots. In fact, my first ever car was a Peugeot 407 Estate. Yes, I know, not the kind of thing you'd expect someone to choose as their first car, particularly not for a young petrol head, but it served my needs very well and I have fond memories of it. In some ways, this is that car's direct descendant. It's also the spiciest Peugeot for quite some time. In fact, it's the most powerful car they've ever made. And just look at it. OK, they've ditched the styling of old, and if you took the badges of this, if you made me guess, I'd say maybe it's a BMW or more likely a Skoda. But there is a lot to like about it, and um, it certainly promises to be rather exciting. After all, it's got McLaren 675 LT style aero on the side, albeit adorned with some rather cheap looking stickers. But still, this is a good looker, even if I wouldn't choose this selenium grey paint as my first option. Psst. Ow. So then, what's the Peugeot up against? Well, the obvious choices would of course come from Germany. I have no experience of the Mercedes range, but I have driven the BMW M340i, which you can get in both petrol or diesel guise. You have the Audi S4, now available exclusively as a diesel here in Europe, but also you've got stuff like the now discontinued Volvo V60 Polestar engineered, and more oddball stuff like the Jaguar XF Sport Brake, which yes, they are still making, and the recently arrived Genesis G7, shooting brake. How does this stack up? Well, in terms of power, fairly well. It has less than the Volvo, which made some 400 horsepower. This is just shy of 360. That means it's just a little bit less than the BMW, but more than the Audi, quite a bit more than the Jaguar that makes 300, and a lot more than the Genesis that made only 240 and cost a similar amount to this. In fact, as prices go, this also falls bang in the middle of the pack. It's cheaper than some of the higher specified BMW and Audis, but it's also more expensive than a top spec Genesis or something like the Jaguar if you don't stick too many options on it. This car, as tested, is about £56,000, which is not cheap, but if you compare it to some of its pure electric rivals, it can still offer somewhat good value for money. Considering we're talking here about only a small number of cars, there's a great variety of powertrains to choose from, and I think that's going to be a key factor in influencing your decision. The most old school for me is the M340i, because though it has a mild hybrid system, it's also got a beautiful 3-litre straight-six turbocharged engine that is a masterpiece. If you want something a little more economical, you can get the 340d or the Audi, which is also now available exclusively as a diesel, but I think many people will be put off by that. Likewise, the second-generation XF was never offered with a meaty petrol engine engine. The top of the range has always been the 300 horsepower V6 diesel, which is a fine power plant in of itself, but I think simply not one that many people want to commit to now. This really is closest to the Polestar, which is a hybrid and differs in a couple of ways. That had a two-litre four-cylinder engine up front with twin charging, turbo and supercharged. This is a 1.6-litre, just turbocharged engine and makes a little bit less power on its own, 200 horses. However, where the Polestar has one electric motor, this has two. And I've had a little bit of a tough time with this car because the spec sheet that I had didn't quite get things right. And that told me that the petrol engine puts out 200 horsepower, which it does, and 221 pound-foot of torque. It's about 300 newton meters. That is correct. However, it also told me that this car had only the one electric motor, which made 520 newton meters of torque. That is not right. What is actually correct is that this car has two electric motors, 
one front, one rear, a configuration we're seeing a lot more now, particularly on pure electric vehicles. And here are the specs. The front one makes 109 horsepower and the rear one makes 111. Curiously though, the torque figures are wildly different because the front makes 236 pound-feet, that's 320 newton meters, and the rear makes just 122 pound-feet. That's 166 newton meters. Um, in any case, this is the most powerful Peugeot ever made. 355 horsepower, 384 pound-foot of torque, that's 520 newton meters. And it compares favorably with pure BEV vehicles as well, because it weighs 1875 kilos. So it's not especially light, but as these things go, that's kind of about right. It's certainly a little bit lighter on its feet than the Polestar, which tipped the scales at over two tons. This car is a plug-in hybrid, has a battery pack of just over 11 kilowatt hour. So with those motors, it can do up to 84 mile an hour without the combustion engine for a total range of just over 20 miles on pure electricity. Handily, they've also packaged it in such a way that you don't lose any boot space by having the hybrid system. But sadly, Peugeot have repeated a mistake that their Stellantis siblings DS made with the DS7 that I drove. Your regular 508 will have a fuel tank of either 63 or 55 litres depending on the engine that you choose. But this has a tank of only 43 litres. That's basically nothing. And it means that somehow Peugeot have managed to give a combustion engine car range anxiety because this will get only about 300 miles between fill-ups. And if the car has drained its battery, which on a long journey it will do very quickly, it'll achieve only about 32 or 33 to the gallon. As Immortan Joe might say, mediocre. Happily though, there is some good news because though this car may be 56,000 pounds, pricing it similarly to its Audi and BMW rivals, for your money, you do get essentially everything. There is very little in the way of options to tick for the 508. The only one of any significance is the panoramic roof, which is 870 pounds and an option I would certainly tick, even if the Peugeot press office did not. Beyond that, really, the only thing to choose is your exterior color. This is the selenium gray, but you can also have a black or a white. And the specification is generous. You have full LED lights. You have these very nice looking 20 inch wheels, four pot Alcon brakes up the front, although very disappointing and small ones at the back. All the aero stuff is standard. It's not a pack. You have active cruise control with stop and go technology. You have a 360 degree camera and an interior that certainly stands out. If you were to ask anybody to choose one word to describe old French cars, it's likely to be quirky. And I'm happy to say the 508 PSE does pay tribute to its Gaulic past in some nice ways. You've got the tiniest steering wheel this side of a Caterham, and the last time I saw something like this in a car, it was the old Peugeot 208 by Peugeot Sport. It means that the dash is over the wheel and it actually works a lot better than you might think. Although it is slightly confusing to use and these buttons simply aren't very well utilized. The display up here is kind of nice. It's decent to look at, bright enough. Curiously, they are determined to hide the rev counter, but there's a few different settings, including one that I kind of like, which replicates the old barrel style speedo of old Citroens. That's cool. This display in the middle, again, nice, high resolution, fairly bright, but it frustrates. It has Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but as it's just one display to control everything, if you want to do even basic stuff, like change the cabin temperature, you need to go to another display, handily. There are some hotkeys for it down here, physical ones, but that means when you're doing that stuff, you cannot see your nav or anything else if you're using Android or Apple for it, which I think most people will. It doesn't talk to this display up here, which would be handy if it did, because that would get around a few issues. It's also not the most responsive system. This car has a Focal stereo in, which is only a five or 600 quid option in other 508s, and it does a good enough job. These seats look beautiful, and if I didn't know better, I'd say they're tailored for the 508 PSE, but they're not. They're in fact the same seats as in the regular 508, just with different trim. So you've got heating, massage functions, but not cooling, which uh, in this weather, I would rather appreciate. They're also just a touch too narrow. They need to be about an inch wider either side because the way they've sculpted them, they're just a bit narrow for my frame. Yes, and I'm not the smallest person, but I tend not to have an issue in cars, certainly not regular ones. So that's something interesting to note. 
Otherwise, the interior is a somewhat Germanic and very angular affair with lots of probably faux carbon, a few buttons, and sadly, this is the only colour choice. If you want a 508 PSE, your interior is going to look like this. Happily, there is a decent amount of space in the back, and the boot is fairly generous too, if not amazing. Just over 500 litres, so decent enough, I'd say, for most uses, but not likely to impress your diehard antiques buyer. Once upon a time, it was almost a given that a Peugeot was going to receive a performance offering, a GTI, perhaps even a rally. And those were badges that adorned some of the finest driver's cars available at affordable prices. Today, the story is very different. Not only is this car priced the same as one of its German rivals, it's also the only car in the Peugeot lineup aimed at the sporty driver. So, it needs to be good. Let's find out if it is. I must confess, I've really been rooting for the Peugeot. Perhaps it's a very British thing, we always do love an underdog. And in the cut and thrust world of high performance cars, a Peugeot is certainly an underdog. However, that doesn't mean I'm going to give a car a thumbs up, just because it's a little bit different and interesting. Whilst those are certainly very admirable qualities, they are nowhere near enough to justify spending this sort of money on. There's a lot to really like about it. First off, put your foot down, and it is quick. It has ample shove, will throw you back into the seat and feels very much the claimed 355 horsepower. It doesn't have the incredible off the line surge of a full electric car or the top end fireworks of an old school naturally aspirated one. But for most people, I'd say it does the business. As you might imagine, in terms of power delivery, it feels closest to the Volvo. It seems almost a little bit disingenuous talking about the V60 Polestar engineered so much when that's now a car you cannot buy. However, there is a very similar sounding V60 Recharge which has much of the same tech, just less fancy engine stuff and a little bit less power, but is overall the same thing and is a touch cheaper. In practice, the V60 Polestar engineer went out of production so recently you can still buy one of those and get more or less all the benefits of having got one new. One of the real surprises of this car, and I have to say partly a disappointment, is the dynamics. As standard, the 508 PSE comes with active suspension. It has several modes, though they're tied into the drive modes, of which you have quite a few. So there's electric, comfort, hybrid, sport, and four-wheel drive. I think you can guess what most of them do. Annoyingly, like the DS7, it always tries to default into electric, or at least that's what it seemed to do while I've had it, and that's frustrating because by the time you realise that's what it's up to, it has sapped a lot of power. Just now, I'm in comfort mode, but unlike the DS, which was genuinely very comfortable, this does struggle a little bit. It's a lot firmer than just about any other Peugeot I've ever experienced. And that's a shame, because I think if you were to ask a lot of people what the fine qualities of French cars are, many would cite the ride comfort. In fact, with something like this, I wouldn't mind if the car's USP was the fact, OK, it won't go around a corner like the Volvo, but it is rather comfy. However, it's not. Fortunately, as you may imagine, there is a benefit because many a French car isn't particularly keen to turn in. That first sort of almost quarter turn sometimes feels like the car is doing very little. However, with this, it's much keener to respond. In fact, here it feels like you require only the tiniest input to this very small wheel and the car will bend to your will. It seems very keen, very agile and in some ways more like a hot hatch to drive than a large estate car. And that regard reminds me almost of the Jaguar XE rather than the XF. Though I did a bit of moaning about the seats earlier, one thing I do love is the massage function. You have several settings available, it's the same as in the DS7 I drove, and they are all very good. It's quite enjoyable and something you don't often see in cars at this price point. I like it. Around town and through the villages, the powertrain is fairly smooth, pretty dependable, and very often you will find yourself in full electric mode, as I am now, although strictly speaking, I think the car is actually coasting. I'm now going to take the driving mode from comfort to sport. We'll put our foot down and see what happens when you try and press on. It 
it's an odd duck to drive this car because it almost seems to reward a level of ham-fistedness, or more accurately, ham-footedness. If you just mash the throttle pedal all the way down, it actually responds smoothly, linearly, and actually quite nicely. But so when you try and do something a little more nuanced, it comes unstuck. See, stuff like that, out of a tight bend, foot down, car feels great nice and quick, gets up to the speed limit very, very easily. You do get the sensation that if you were to pass through said speed limit, it might ultimately struggle a little bit. And this is something I've found with many of these hybrids. You have all these disparate powertrains and at lower speed, they work well together. But as you go a little bit quicker, they don't always seem to cooperate quite so well. A chance now to try the brakes. There's a little bit of dead travel at the top of the pedal, but I kind of expect that with a French car and then the rest of it works very, very well. Performance out of a bend is absolutely fantastic. Put your foot down and it really does move. Overall grip does seem somewhat limited. A couple of the tighter sections here, I've already heard tires chirping, which is of course a sign that I should really take it just a little bit easier. A shame really, because actually the steering does start to come alive. It's quite enjoyable. And this tiny wheel in your hand does really give you that kind of video game type feeling. That sort of stuff, it absolutely loves, but this is all very well and good when you're simply going to drive it round like a golf R, foot down all the way, turn, turn, turn. If that's your driving style, you're going to enjoy this. But if, like me, you really enjoy the precision of interaction between man and machine, being able to feel every individual element working as you tell it to, this is not the car for you. We'll start with the gearbox. It's an eight-speed automatic. And uh, there are some paddles, they don't move. I've no issues with that but there seems to be absolutely no way to set the car permanently into manual. Even in sport mode, it's now gone back to shifting itself. You also need to find a screen that shows you what RPM you're actually doing, and the only one thus far that does it is the individual setting. The gearbox is not terrible, it's a tiny bit tardy but not awful, and actually I'd love to see this engine and gearbox combo in a regular car without any of the hybrid stuff, because it'd probably be pretty decent. I'm sure Peugeot do make that car, or certainly have in the recent past, but I don't recall anything recently being small and sporty to come out of the company. It is such a shame that the car is so keen to take control away from you, because once you do get a few RPM behind it, the thing responds really well, and you get the sensation that that engine on its own is actually quite good. I would love to have seen this car made with a larger combustion engine, like in the Volvo, a two litre or something, not really particularly extravagant, and I'm quite confident you could still get similar fuel economy figures. In terms of fuel economy, the best I achieved was on a run to the airport where I was driving the car in hybrid mode. I had a full tank of both petrol and electricity, and I achieved something like 43 to the gallon. On another very similar journey where I was preserving the electric power ahead of this review, I achieved only 32. And if you're going to do a long journey, so you are driving hundreds of miles in a day, that is what this car is going to drop down to. It's for that reason that I'm so frustrated with the size of the fuel tank, because if this car had a 60 litre one, I wouldn't really be all that fast. You'd still have plenty of range, even at 30 or to the gallon. But with a tank that's uh, 43 litres, it's pretty poor. In fact, this car's currently telling me I've got three quarters of a tank and only 149 miles of range. That means if you buy a Peugeot 508 PSE, you're going to be visiting the petrol station just as frequently as your local Ferrari owner. The cruise control functionality seems to work very well, quite smooth, quite intuitive, although I have to say that the stalk for it was very, very frustrating to learn because it's obscured entirely by the arm of this wheel. So when I first tried to use it, I had no idea what did anything, and I spent ages trying to work it out until I realized cruise was actually off and it's a little dial that engages it. This car also has a speed limiter. I think more cars should have them. Sometimes they're a lot more useful than cruise. Case in point, when I was younger, my mum had a Citroen C4 by Loeb. Not that Sebastian Loeb probably ever saw one, but that had a speed limiter in it. So when I was driving around town, I had that set to sort of 31 mile an hour. And that way I knew I didn't really have to pay attention to the speedo. The car would just stop me when I got to 30. Simple and very, very useful. In terms of placing on the road, this car is actually a pretty good size. You can judge it fairly easily. The bonnet, you can see some of. You do get something of a sense of where the rest of the car is. So that's not terrible. 
it really is at these lower speeds. We're just about to hit another 30 limit where the powertrain is at its absolute happiest. And that's annoying because this is where the suspension is at its unhappiest. I don't know quite how they've managed it, but here Peugeot have done the very American thing. I've had this with a lot of Mustangs and the like. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but I suspect the springs are perhaps a little too stiff, the dampers perhaps a little too soft, because it will crash over lumps and bumps in the road surface, needlessly so, but then it will also go very wallowy at certain points in time as well. It's just not got the sophistication of damping that something like the Volvo does. That also had a fairly firm ride, but was exceedingly well controlled. This is not. Other things I have noticed, the reversing camera is laughably bad. I imagine there's some 1990s bullet cam sticking out the back because it looks atrocious. And in the bright sun like we had earlier, it was almost impossible to see out of. That's an odd thing to get wrong in a modern car. Truthfully, the biggest issue with this car is, I think, a philosophical one, and I've seen a lot of companies get this wrong. Hybrid systems tend to be used by firms for one of two things, either improving economy or performance. Go for one or the other, and things generally work out okay. The Ferrari SF90. They're not really trying to kid anybody. The hybrid is there for economy. It just makes it go faster, and go faster it does. Likewise, the Toyota Corolla. The hybrid system is there for economy, and the whole car is designed around having a hybrid system. This feels like a car that's had a hybrid sort of grafted onto it, and it's a little bit at odds with itself. Every now and again, when you're asking for the power, you'll feel it be delivered in several stages. You get one or two moments where it kicks you a little bit more in the back, and it's quite frustrating. You never feel like you really have any control over what's going on. The fact you've got paddles here seems almost pointless. Now, I said exactly the same thing about the DS7, but in that, I can more or less forgive it because that was a comfort orientated car, a luxury product that's not really intended for someone to hoof down a country lane. But this is. There are also some very odd design choices in here. It took me absolutely ages to work out where to plug in my phone. As it happens, there's a little sort of cavern underneath the center console here with the gear lever and everything on it. And that's where there's a wireless charging pad and also two USB connectors via Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, and just generic charging. It took ages to find those. I was almost getting to the point where I thought that they perhaps had forgot to put USB points into this car at all. I was getting very frustrated, but whoever designed that, naughty, naughty Peugeot designer. Let's have a little bit of balance, shall we? More things that I like. I appreciate the fact they've put some physical hotkeys here below the screen. So, though I may moan about the fact that everything is done on a touchpad, you do at least still have easy ways to getting to your most commonly used settings, and that I really do like. I also appreciate the fact that it has a very clear screen where you can tell it to reserve some energy, and if it doesn't have enough, it will charge itself. To get to that screen, press the toggle on the right, which has the little lightning bolt on it, go to the menu that's called eSave, and then you tell it if you want six, 12 or all of the miles kept in reserve. If it doesn't have enough of those, it will then charge manually. But uh, be wary, when it does that, it will drink fuel like it's going out of fashion, which it may well be. For manoeuvring, the gear lever also responds really nicely. You're going from drive to reverse, happens smoothly and effortlessly, which it doesn't in all modern cars. I also like the frameless windows, and I think it is a great looking thing. I think it's a shame they only offer it in three very, very boring colors, the black, white, and this selenium gray. That to me is a tragedy. Cars like this do make me just a little bit sad because I so desperately want to tell you to buy it, if for no other reason than nobody else seems to have done so. However, unlike the Polestar, which really felt like a premium upmarket product, it felt like the 60,000 quid Volvo were asking, this does struggle a little bit. I think most people would still rather go with the Audi or BMW interior, even if, truth be told, this is doing a pretty good job of keeping up. For those who simply don't care about the performance aspect, the Genesis feels a lot more luxurious again. This car also has the softest, most luxurious feeling armrest ever. 
it's here totally out of place because nothing else in the car feels this way but uh, you won't find me complaining about it because it's brilliant that's pure frenchness love it that Genesis I drove was admittedly nearly as expensive as this for a car with more than 100 horsepower less. However, it had just the straightforward petrol engine, which some people may prefer, and it did overall a better job of conveying the luxury thing. The interior also felt just that little bit more cohesive. This feels somewhat disjointed, and every now and again you'll go to do things like turn the car on or off, and you'll find switches to be just annoyingly unresponsive. I also cannot help but wonder what this car's total lack of popularity is going to do to its residual values. I expect nothing good. And ultimately, for me, the Peugeot 508 PSE is a car that failed simply because it didn't really commit to one design brief or another. It certainly doesn't have anywhere near enough environmental credentials to appeal to somebody that wants to buy something to save the planet. To be honest, for this money, they'll probably just go and buy a Tesla Model 3 instead and have something a lot quicker and a lot more popular that'll hold its money a lot better. Then, for the performance junkie, it's all a little bit disjointed, doesn't really want to work with you, is keen only to do its own thing, and for me, just doesn't reward the keen driver. Certainly not in the way that GTIs of old did. And that's a shame, because Peugeot has a rich and storied history of brilliant performance cars. But this is not going to be one of them. Sorry. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.